The Group of 20, also known as the G20, is the main forum for economic cooperation and dialogue among the world's leading economies. And for the next year, the group will be presided over by Brazil. G20 summits held in Indonesia in 2022 and India in 2023, and scheduled for Brazil in 2024, have brought rising powers from the global south to the forefront of international venues. These countries have been able to set an agenda stressing the priorities of developing nations' development, debt financing, food security and climate change. This is in contrast with the Group of Seven, or G7, which in recent years has focused on geopolitics and the war in Ukraine. This week, we will discuss what the Brazilian presidency of the G20 means for the country and the world. My name is Gustavo Ribeiro, I'm the editor-in-chief of the Brazilian Report. This is Explaining Brazil. If you like Explaining Brazil, you should subscribe to the Brazilian Report, the journalistic engine behind this podcast. We are an independent organization funded by subscribers, and you can help us stay independent and continue producing award-winning journalism. And if you are already a subscriber, you can go the extra mile and join our Buy Me A Coffee fan page. In return, you can get exclusive perks like special newsletters and behind-the-scenes content, as well as a shout-out here on our podcast. And I need to give a special thanks to our subscriber, Carson Allen, who really went the extra mile and bought us 25 cups of coffee this week. So thanks, Carson, for going above and beyond. This is really appreciated. And today, I would also like to thank our Buy Me A Coffee members, Carson Allen, as I have already mentioned, Gabriel Luca, Andre Novoseltsev, Ben Ludwig, Leslie Seal, Mark Hillary, Luis Hens, Erwin Menez, Aaron Berger, Karis Vrezvik, Alasdair Townsend, Miller Renacido, Peter Abrahamson, Jim Awofadeju, David Dixon, Jose Rosi Stankovic, Emerging Market Muser, Anna Lund, Peter Suffering, Anderson da Silva, and someone who chose to remain anonymous. And our Buy Me A Coffee members come from all over the world, so please, if we are butchering the pronunciation of your name, do send us an email. And if you too believe in the importance of independent journalism and want to hear your name on our podcast, go to buymeacoffee.com slash Brazilian Report and subscribe to one of the membership tiers. Click on buymeacoffee.com slash Brazilian Report to learn more. discuss Brazil's presidency of the G20, I have invited this week Bruna Santos, director of the Woodrow Wilson Center's Brazil Institute in Washington, D.C. Bruna, thanks for joining us. So many critics have dismissed the G20 as an ineffectual talking shop. So in your opinion, how important is the Group of 20 still today? Yeah, I think that many of the summits these days are being discredited as talking shops. I think some of them, obviously, they have um, they have expanded to a level that um, I think it's unprecedented. Like if you look at COP, that just um, we're just seeing happening in Dubai, it's becoming the new Davos, right? It's like so large, everyone is there. But um, at the same time, I think for looking at the G20 and the current um, like situation globally and how Brazil is positioning itself right after India, before South Africa, I think it's, it's extremely important to look at the G20 summit as an important uh, convening to remind also global like major powers that the world beyond uh, geopolitical conflicts is um, seeking to have a voice on the table. So uh, to look at the bilateral and multilateral relations be beyond the current uh, geopolitical conflicts that we see out there and all those challenges related to climate change, to food security, um, tech regulation, the, the need to multilateral development bank reforms, those are issues that cannot be um, discussed 
or uh, undertaken without uh, having the, the emerging world, the developing world at the table. So I think that's the one important aspect of the G20. And this year, I'm really enthusiastic and I want to see how it unfolds. The fact that the African Union has joined the group, I think it may alter the character of the platform and it may be an, a moment uh, to to make it more inclusive and more representative. I was honestly expecting Lula to be the leader to change the name of the group, to call it G21. He did not change that. But let's see how, how the African Union is going gonna, is gonna, to... Um, behave and how they're going to take part in the in the discussions and also how how they will find um coherence across the the group as well to have a good representation at the at the summit and what are Brazil's priorities for this G20 presidency? Yeah, so um, there's so much going on, right? There, but obviously like Brazil has um, has announced uh, the three priorities in their social inclusion and fight uh, fighting hunger, uh, also renewable energy, which is important to note that at the same time Brazil is prioritizing it. It's announcing joining OPEC plus a COP and don't have a clear phase out plan for fossil fuels, but it's there, it's in the agenda and also reforming the global economic governance. Um, as I said, I think uh, I think the the Brazil's presidency marks a, a significant milestone in the country's role in the global like diplomatic stage, obviously. But our ability to be coherent with our um, goals and the priorities we outlined, and the, our ability to deliver that, I think that's where lies our main uh, challenge the main risk to not be able to um, to deliver such an ambitious agenda. Now, Bruna, Lula has given tons of attention to in the international agenda and sometimes to a fault if you ask a big chunk of the Brazilian electorate. He has sought to place Brazil on the global stage as a sort of mediator for several conflicts and tensions the world is experiencing. And by the time he finishes his term in 2026, Brazil will have held rotating presidencies of the UN Security Council, the Mercosur Trade Alliance, the BRICS Group of Developing Nations, and, as we mentioned, now the G20, as well as hosting the UN Climate Change Conference in late 2025. So what kind of platform will the presidency of the G20 specifically give him? Well, I think that uh, well, we have to remember how the G20 started. It started as a finance minister's convening. So I think that any aspect relate, uh, related to climate financing, um, restructuring the key global um, financial institutions like the World Bank, the IMF, I think those are the, 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 those are the issues that have in the G20 a more exclusive forum to this for discussions. Um, but obviously what we are seeing, especially when, it, when we are looking at um, renewable energy and phasing out fossil fuels, is that uh, for the first time you have uh, the green agenda as a priority to the economy agenda. And that's where the climate finance steps in and the, the fact that Lula is, has decided to create a special group within the, the G20, the Global Mobilization Working Group. Um, I think it's a demonstration of that priority, but at the same time, it, it, um, it raises all, like, everyone's expectations about the ability of Brazil to deliver that. Uh, and also, I think we have to take into consideration that, okay, we have reasons to be I'd say cautiously optimistic about Brazil. We are looking at the, the, the tendency of uh, an expected GDP growth of 3%. Um, but Brazil ha still has like a fragile macroeconomic backdrop. So it's in, in its, it's a, a, a the, the G20 is such a like a, a forum 
for t- the discussion of those economic uh, matters that I think this is could be a liability for Brazil. So if I could point out some of the risks that Brazil face, one is obviously the fact that, yeah, we still have some homework to do uh, in terms of macroeconomic policy. We still have some... Um, homework to do in terms of giving clarity to what is Brazil's uh, phasing out fossil fuels plan with more clarity, dates, deadlines, and uh, what is the Brazil's position in that front. And also um, how Brazil may or may not be able to deliver that green economy potential, given that uh, it relies so much on the capacity also to Brazil to deliver other policies related to infrastructure, related to um, basic infrastructure in regions of Brazil that are still underdeveloped. So I think those are, um, I'd say, elephants in the room that we have to address, and they are part of our long to-do list in order to um, deliver what we have to deliver to be at least remembered as an important um, leader in those uh, years that you just very well described with where we took position, leadership positions in, in important uh, international forum. Now, you're mentioning that Brazil has not presented a plan to move away from fossil fuels. And I would add that it did quite the contrary, actually. Our mines and energy minister said oil is not in the past and members of the government want Petrobras to be, quote, the world's last oil company standing. And I mean, Brazil always gloats about having a clean electric matrix and Lula's government has managed to curb Amazon deforestation. And this is true. But deforestation is climbing in other biomes and the Lula administration is pretty bullish on oil and fracking, which are by no means green. So, I mean, I know that these contradictions are not exclusive to Lula or to Brazil. Of course, they're not. But Lula's sort of holier-than-thou comments during COP28 when he said developed countries have eloquent but empty words and that they are not doing the job fast enough, I mean, that can make people more attentive to your own contradictions, right? I think this is a contradiction we have to live with and live with and observe because the good thing I think that is that it, it came to the surface. It is a like a conflict of ideas, of priorities, of visions uh, that are obvious in the current government. And now it's so obvious that then people are talking about it, <laughs> which is good. Because I think that when those paradoxes become contradictions, that's when we talk about them and we discuss. What I feel is there is, a, is the lack of clarity in terms of a plan, a clear um, measurable plan for um, phasing out, for uh, not phasing out. You know, there's the lack of clarity that I think concerns many of the people uh, internationally, especially NGOs and observers who have been uh, looking forward to see what Lula would de- will deliver also in uh, when hosting COP. So I'd say that the world observes Brazil with obviously a mix of hope and a lot of skepticism after uh, all that like contradiction emerged. But we have to live with that and observe and see how they will come up with more clarity. Um, this is one thing is important to mention. The other thing I always talk about, Gustavo, and you were probably tired of hearing me say that, is that the key to Brazil's success in terms of like green economy, lies in like transforming its governance model to be more agile and responsive. Whenever we look at the numbers of, for example, the execution, the implementation of budget uh, in the in the public sector, it always demonstrates how hard it is to get things done in Brazil. Another thing is when you look at the disparities in access to basic infrastructure technology uh, in in the north and northeast regions of Brazil. I think it always demonstrates that in order to have, like to achieve the results of the so-called green economy, we need more than a good PowerPoint and a good speech and mobilization of 
private investment internationally, but we need also an execution plan that actually delivers. Another thing is, besides the contradiction that we see more broadly in, the, in Lula's speech in the Ministry of Energy and um, across the government, the contradiction we are seeing now in bills that are uh, coming out of government now, like the the, the bill that regulates uh, offshore, wind offshore in Brazil. At the same time, it regulates this important market that we've been for a long time waiting for more clarity on this. It also creates incentives to coal-based uh, plants. So those are issues that fa- make the, the path ahead of Brazil in terms of um, becoming a, a green power um, extremely complicated. And when I talk about the capacity of Brazil to deliver those, uh, this and become a green powerhouse, that's for me a major, major issue. Because combined with our macroeconomic fragile backdrop, we have a situation, a political situation that's not favorable for Lula in, in Congress in terms of governability and delivery. And we have a uh, uh, a governance apparatus that has demonstrated a lot of uh, difficulties. If you look at, for example, the, the, the backlog of projects, solar plant projects, in waiting for, um, for approvals and to environmental approvals and, for, uh, and other um, like bureaucratic uh, steps to be implemented in Brazil, you would like you would really be, be desperate. Like those numbers are really uh, impressive. And I think they, they relate to our capacity, not only to have a good vision and as I said, like a good, um, but a- effectively delivering environmental stewardship. And those are the complex cities that I think we have to be always aware of and looking at and uh, make the, the get the homework done. Otherwise, it will be, uh, again, uh, the flight of the chicken, as we have seen before in so many other moments of great opportunities for Brazil that we just couldn't uh, live up to the potential. When Lula took office, he said Brazil would be back. And he, most than maybe all of his predecessors, relies on a style of presidential diplomacy. And I remember Barack Obama once called him the man, But the world is quite different now, right? I mean, can Lula still be the man? No, I I don't think the world is actually now um, looking at him like that and not even... um, I don't think there's the need and I don't think he... I think that the storms, the rhetorical storms that he has engaged in the early days of his, uh, his government especially not only mentioning like in foreign policy, but also the decisions that he, the remarks that he made about, for example, challenging the the, the independence of the the, the central bank or making it more, um, making questionable, uh, prioritizing questionable policies in Congress, like the one that was supposed to reverse the sanitation bill. I think all that, gave us more clarity on like, okay, there's not necessarily um, the man, if, if there is a man here, it's the man after, the, he's still looking at the world with the lens of um, the first and second terms and not necessarily an updated man. So I don't think there is space for that anymore. I think there is, uh, I, what I see is that um, many of the mistakes uh, of like, root and rhetoric, I think they were corrected. More recently, I think there is still, of course, uh, many aspects where Lula and his team needed to gather more clarity and coordination and portray that to the world. But at the same time, I don't think there is space for that, like for the man anymore. Uh, There are obviously conflicts and aspects related to Venezuela now and Guyana, for example, where Lula can have an important role, but there is no no space for um, a hero or a Nobel Prize here anymore. If there were ever a space, I think it's gone. And these faux pas you mentioned, 
Lula's Brazil has vexed traditional Western allies due to his approach to the Ukraine-Russia war and to a lesser extent to the Israel-Hamas conflict. How much can these positions defended by the Brazilian government undermine its leadership in the G20? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that we saw um, we saw India facing the same um, problems. But one thing that I think is different for Lula now is that when you look at, for example, what the BRICS in the in twenty twenty four will look like compared to what the BRICS was like looking um, before, I think uh, it may give um, may give him more uh, room to um, more lever to maneuver the G20 um, as, a, as a platform that convenes not only rich but developing countries. And um, I think it may, um, it may give him less, um, less of the faith and confidence from other major powers such as the European Union and the U.S., when it comes to the positions related to geopolitics. But again, I think the G20 is a forum to go beyond that. I think when it comes to the UN Security Council, that's a different aspect. But for the G20, I think we are looking at a different, uh, the, looking at the world through a different prisma. Uh, I think that the Lula's uh, non-alignment or hedging bets strategy is already clear both to, to the US and to the European Union after so many, like, uh, different positions that Lula has undertaken, both about Hamas and Israel, but also Ukraine and Russia. So I think it became clear that Lula, that Brazil under Lula is not an ally to the U.S., but a, a good friend. And that's already, th this this page is turned. But um, I do believe that the G20 is a forum where uh, those countries are looking beyond geopolitics and looking at the, how much of the, the geopolitics is actually influencing the economy, such as the geopoliticization of trade and how it may or may not influence the, the, the dollarization or de-dollarization uh, of foreign trade and so forth, but not necessarily looking at those positions at, at, uh, more specifically. And Bruno, we have discussed the upside of the G20 presidency, both for Brazil and for Lula, but I mean, what could be considered a flop uh, about this presidency? And if it flops, what would be the downside of it for Brazil and Lula? This government has engaged in some rhetorical storms before. I think if I think in 2024, if we repeat that and um, fail to play a moderate um, a moderation role in in the conflicts in the region, especially, it may be like it's it's a major risk. Also, as I said before, Brazil has a fragile macroeconomic situation, so I think we have to be aware of that and understand that um, if we face a major um, economic crisis or if Lula fails to deliver those commitments related to. Um, phasing out fossil fuels and giving at least more clarity on that, I think it may it, it will become a, a presidency that, again, was a very rhetorical, lots of promises and not, not no delivery whatsoever. And I think those are the, the possibilities uh, that we have in front of us are more, um, they represent a risk and represent above everything a risk not only to the G20 presidency, but to Lula's legacy as a whole in his third mandate. Bruna, thank you very much. Thank you, Gustavo. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here. Bruna Santos is the director of the Woodrow Wilson Center's Brazil Institute in Washington. And the Brazilian Report and the Brazil Institute have teamed up to launch the G20 Dialogues Initiative through live broadcasts, articles and events, we will analyze Brazil's challenges and actions at the helm of the G20. Stay tuned! 
And if you like Explaining Brazil, please give us a five-star rating wherever you get your podcasts. It takes only a second and it really helps us reach a wider audience. Or better yet, subscribe to The Brazilian Report, the journalistic engine behind this podcast. We have a subscription-based business model and your memberships fuel our journalism. Thanks to our subscribers, we have been able to cover Brazil and Latin America extensively and our work has won and been shortlisted for several international awards. More recently, our newsletters won the best newsletter prize in the Americas from the World Association of Newspapers and News Publishers for a small or local newsroom. In order to keep doing that work, we need your support. Go to brazilian.report slash subscribe. I'm Gustavo Ribeiro. Thanks for listening. Explaining Brazil will be back next week.